everyone to the plenary talk sessions of the Financial Market and Corporate Governance Conference. It is my pleasure to introduce our speakers today, Professor Peter Swan. So Peter has a long and distinguished career in finance academics uh, with over more than 50 years. He has made several contributions to theoretical and empirical research in finance with several publications in top economics and finance journals such as um, AER, QJE, JPE, Journal Finance, Review Economic Studies, among others. Uh, he was elected as the Fellows of the uh, Academy of Social Science in Australia and the Royal Societies of New South Wales. He also gained recognition for his service and research in finance from the um, Queen's Birthday Honour List in 2003 and 2016, the Order of Australia, AM and AO, respectively. And this year, the FMCG conference is honoring him with the Lifetime Achievement Awards for contribution to excellent research in finance. So congratulations, Peter, and I'm looking forward to your plenary talks today. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much for that kind introduction, Hugh. And I thank Bella for the fantastic job he's done organizing this uh, conference. It, it's a real work of art, a real uh, achievement, which will go down in uh, in history, there's an awful lot of learning to get this uh, Zoom system working with such a sophisticated, large conference, so many concurrent sessions and and so on. So it's a magnificent um, achievement. Congratulations. Okay, so thank you very much for inviting me to this talk and thank you so much uh, for the Lifetime Achievement uh, Award. So. Uh, my topic today is about are high-powered incentives confined to when the signal-to-noise ratio is weak. I'm essentially pointing out that the, the, um, the standard agency literature has, um, has a number of problems with it. Uh, in fact, very serious problems because the intuition and, uh, and all the, the major findings are 100% uh, incorrect, unfortunately. <laughs> so we will uh, see what these problems are. So these, what we're dealing with today is, is moral hazard. So moral hazard applies uh, throughout society, throughout economies, for every single business, every single enterprise. And it, we're going to focus on situation where there's a, a risk mutual principle uh, and there's an agency contract and this principle cannot observe the age the actions of the agent and who, who must of necessity be risk averse because uh, if if he wasn't risk averse then we could sell the firm to him or undertake other better kinds of contracts and get to a, a first best solution so um, Bent Holmstrom in his Nobel Prize winning article 979 uh, said that uh, observable outcomes such as a higher stock price are more likely to indicate desirable effort if the noise or stock volatility is low, that is if there's a high signal to noise ratio. So underlying this agency theory in the last 40 years has been this idea that you give more weight to incentive in a contract like pay performance sensitivity should be high when there's a strong signal of the agent's actions which there are in uh, large liquid um, firms. So we should see high pay performance sensitivity in large enterprises according to this theory which did win the uh, Nobel Prize that was awarded fairly recently. Uh, and that what this would indicate is that good indicators of performance should have a high weight, poor indicators, weak signals, a low weight. Uh, but unfortunately, the, the, uh, the reality is very, very different. Uh, it's a plausible sounding theory, but it, all the empirical evidence is 100% uh, contrary to it. In fact, the weight must fall, not rise, with more information about the 
agent's actions. If we've got a good signal of the agent's actions, we don't need a very inefficient high-powered contract because that's very costly to the principal, also very costly to the agent because we've got to impose a whole lot of unnecessary um, risk on the, on the agent. And you can see intuitively that this pro uh, Nobel Prize win winning proposition cannot be true because um, as Ben Holmes from proposed and every agency theorist knows, in the limit, if the agent's actions were perfectly visible to the principal, uh, then no incentives are required as we can achieve the, the first best. So ideal contracts are first best with basically a flat wage and no risk being borne by the, by the agent. And so exactly the same reasoning applies here. If there are informed traders out there who can see the agent's actions, uh, then we can uh, reward the agent based on, on share price by giving the agent uh, a certain amount of equity. But the, the amount of equity as a percentage we have to give him is going to be very large in startups and very, very small in uh, large liquid uh, um, organizations. In fact, we know empirically that uh, for every doubling in firm size, that the pay performance sensitivity halves. So, so there's no way uh, that, that, uh, that uh, these, this proposition could be true. So let's, uh, we need to understand how the literature came by the wrong conclusion. How it could be 100% absolutely wrong and, not, uh, and contradicted by all the known facts which have been known for, for many uh, decades. And um, not only did this famous paper propose that uh, large liquid stocks would have high pay performance sensitivity when we know that generally speaking, the, uh, the agents awarded half a percent or something like that. Middly the half a percent of a trillion dollar companies, it could be a lot of money. But um, the, this, the other very famous portion of this result said is called the informativeness principle. It says that all non-redundant signals, no matter how weak or costly, will be used in an optimal contract. And since there could be hundreds if not thousands of, of, of useful signals in a contract, we'd expect to see very, very uh, long and sophisticated uh, agency contracts, particularly for CEOs and, and people of that that sort. Uh, but in fact, empirically, we don't. Um, we're going to see that mostly uh, stock price is used uh, and virtually every other incentive it, it, it is non-existent. There could be an infinite number of them, but they have very, very little weight, if any weight, in the optimal, in the actual contracts. So what I'm going to argue is that the um, stock price incentives for, for, for liquid traded companies are so powerful that no other contract to say for is possible. You can't use, you can't use uh, accounting, for example, you can't use accounting earnings because um, you'd have to give it a negative weight. And many, many uh, studies find that the negative weight is optimal, which of course it can't be optimal, it can't be, you can't reward uh, managers for destroying accounting wealth. Uh, otherwise you'd be paying them a fortune to, 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 to destroy the world. So it, it's, it's clearly not correct. Uh, so in my new theory, I show that there are circum certain circumstances in which um, both the uh, accounting weight and the equity weight could be positive, but these assumptions are quite uh, implausible and normally the, the principal will offer the most cost effective incentive, either equity or accounting, not both, and that's normally uh, accounting, uh, equity. So here we're really talking about the board uh, representing shareholders as the principal and we, we'll see that uh, contracts are going to be very simple, they're going to be based largely 
on the on pay performance sensitivity and that pay performance sensitivity is going to decline massively as as the firm size and liquidity uh, improves in fact an important article by core guy and Veracchia reports that price incentives are 12 times more important than non-price incentives and these non-price incentives include uh, counting earnings and things of of, of, of that sort. Uh, so normally there'll just be a corner solution in just equity-based incentives. Uh, some firms may retain accounting-based incentives, but often uh, accounting uh, incentives are highly correlated to, to stock prices anyway, making the accounting signals largely irrelevant, as Core Guai and Vareka show. Uh, they also point out that standard economic models based on Holmstrom and Tyrol is just about all the agency theory is, or, or on Holmstrom 79, 79 paper, uh, they're unable to explain about 90% of CEO income because CEO, CEO income mostly comes from capital gains, often from their own shareholdings or shares they've been allocated or purchased. Uh, whereas most studies just look at, at the actual cash payments, bonuses, uh, and other direct payments to, to managers, rather than looking at, at what they really gain, which is the 90% uh, of their income, which comes from, from capital gains. Whereas my model is able to explain the, the centrality of CEO pay, standard models uh, aren't. Um, Yeah, so what what I find is that small startups will ex be forced to, to expose their CEOs to a large share firm risk in the form of high powered contracts, while large liquid firms will do the do the opposite and see see for example Jensen and and Murphy. So Adam Smith was very pessimistic about the future of joint stock companies. Uh, he said that um, uh, these companies, which is the modern corporation, manage other people's money. It cannot be expected that they would watch over it with the same vigilance with which the partners in the private company frequently watch over their own. So he predicted the failure of joint stock uh, companies. Well. I claim that my model can actually explain the modern corporation because it's informed trading, but in the stock market, which is able to appropriately motivate uh, managers and at the same time account for why it is that inside ownership is typically very small in, in large enterprises. Whereas in uh, Holmstrom's model or Holmstrom and Tyrol, uh, of course, it's the opposite. They have to have very large inside ownership in order to, to be able to, uh, to govern. Uh, so let's, all right, moving on quickly. So as, as liquidity improves, we'll go from perhaps just using accounting incentives to, to equity incentives and then to low powered equity incentives Uh, so I'm actually going to redo the Holmstrom and Tyrol 93 model in the JPE, keeping their basic assumptions, but uh, my conclusion is the exact opposite of all of their, their findings. Uh, there is a, a problem with listed equity. The number of listed companies has fallen by 55% since 1996. And by 35% in the UK, it's getting more and more difficult for even for large uh, listed companies to survive and smaller ones get quickly absorbed through acquisition. And I'm going to say that has a lot to do with regulation of board structures. Uh, so we're going to be looking at second best contracts. 
and um, we've got informed traders who who maximize their profits by they receive a signal which reflects information coming in to the uh, stock from um, these informed traders from which we can derive a demand function which depends basically on the difference between the observed level of performance or um, effort put, being put in by the manager and equilibrium effort there is uh, I think I've actually jumped a slide here but anyway let's since the time is short uh, this is this is fundamental volatility in the stock price this is this is the error in the informed traders signal so he may not have a perfect signal of of or may not be able to predict perfectly future uh, returns and future prices out of this model comes measure mu of stock price informativeness which corresponds to um, Hallstrom and Tyrold's 93 paper depends on the Kyle lambda of information or uh, the number of informed traders which is arbitrary in my model and the slope of this demand uh, function here for, for informed trading so mu is zero for if the stock is illiquid and there's no informed trading mu is the highest possible value of mu is one if there are many traders and, and there's a lot of information uh, so these this is the signal received by these informed traders this is intrinsic volatility and this is the noise term or error term uh, there's also an accounting earnings signal which once again depends on effort and a, a random error term which differs from Holstrom and Tyrol because they they put this term in there as well which violates their model because um, essentially the equity term will always dominate the, the accounting term so it's not not a valid specification so this is the kind of uh, asset pricing function one gets so the stock price depends on one minus alpha which is a transform of the incentive weight what why is this transform here well this is the this is um there's two there's two kinds of of, of float there's the free float which is one minus alpha and there's the non-free float which is the float owned by management by the manager so the shareholders receive nothing from shares owned by the manager so only the free float here is priced and you can see uh, this is volatility in noise traders here um, you can see that price depends on basically on the actual level of effort being put in by managers which is a function of information mu so this is the grossing up factor uh, and this is a simple transformation so just going very quickly through this managers income depends on his actual but not observable effort e and not on equilibrium effort so he receives a, a fraction a which is the incentive weight times mu e we've seen from that pricing equation plus the accounting weight times mu e effort which um, means that the manager receives a fixed wage plus an incentive for equity and incentive for accounting times times his effort so he maximizes his income stream less quadratic cost of effort so this is the equilibrium level of effort depends 
on the incentive weight here, information stock price, and on the accounting weight here. Uh, the variance of the manager's income is very simple, depends on this incentive weight squared information and intrinsic volatility and the volatility in accounting earnings. We solve for the manager's fixed wage, which depends on effort cost, less incentive payments plus risk cost, meaning that the expected income of the manager depends just on his F on his risk and his effort costs. So this is how much the, the manager will be rewarded. When we do that, we max the, man, the principal maximizes the firm's profits here, uh, which is ex, pri, price minus the outlay on the manager. It yields solutions for optimal alpha and A for counting. Uh, we must it must be greater than zero and less than one basically uh, to be viable. Uh, so solving for the, the two simultaneous equations, we see that, that the, the uh, weight on equity is a bit implausible because these mu is less than, usually less than one, is degree of risk aversion usually less than one, cost of effort less than one, and this is the volatility of the accounting earnings, which is normally less than one. So uh, yet we're subtracting one, so this will often be, be negative, but if that's, that's negative, then uh, the numerator is going to change sign. So if we look at the accounting earnings, it's only positive if this denominator is positive. So generally won't, uh, generally this will be negative and this will be uh, positive. So the sign will be reversed. And that means uh, that normally they won't, won't both be valid. So if both were to be valid, we can see the ratio of the incentives here, uh, but that's, um, as I said, very implausible. Now let's go up. A more plausible solution is a corner solution in which just the equity incentive weight is viable. So this is what, what we get. We get that weight depends on one, one over one plus the information in the stock price. Plus this is a standard uh, term in every agency model. Uh, the weight, the constant absolute risk aversion uh, cost of effort by the manager and the intrinsic volatility. So if we set mu equal to zero, this would just be the standard uh, finding of numerous uh, authors, including um, Holmstrom and Milgram and various, various others. So for the first time, what I've done is to show that that uh, general um, most famous case where mu zero is actually not, actually has a, a much higher stock price weight than what happens when there's information. The more information there is here, the lower is the stock price weight. So it's very inefficient just to give the manager uh, uh, shares to act on shareholders' behalf because uh, if no one else can see his actions, he has to be self-motivated, he has to have a very large share and he's going to take on a lot of risk and therefore he's going to have to be paid a lot. Whereas my model is very simple. The limiting case is just the standard case and mu, mu here is between zero and one. So liquid, large liquid companies will have a very low weight here and small startups will have a high weight here. And here is our information content depends on the error term relative to the volatility in stock price and the number of informed traders. So moving on quickly, uh, given that we've got only limited time, 
uh, you can see the the equity incentive weight is falling rather than increasing the stock price signal. Uh, greater precision in the price signal uh, raises incentive weight, and, and these are these other findings are, are stand, pretty standard. Uh, let's look at a few issues. Vertical integration can be explained. Uh, that requires higher inside ownership, which is, requires uh, more inefficient incentives. So that's going to reduce the free float and noise trade. And so we're going to have uh, low, weak, weak incentives. So it's the high cost of being vertically integrated. Uh, companies have found a way around this by splitting their shares between uh, uh, dual class shares into insiders and outsiders. Insiders have, have control rights, but not cash flow rights typically. Uh, and this enables uh, a competitive market in, in the cash rich shares to be established to provide better incentives. Uh, with LBOs, um, the incentives need to be much higher. Like Leslie and Oya, for example, show that uh, the whole put, because there's no stock price in an LBO, private equity doesn't have a stock price, incentives have to be much higher and therefore not, not as efficient as with listed companies. Uh, Holmstrom and Milgram are puzzled by evidence which shows that the harder it is to monitor a unit as proxied by its distance from headquarters, the more likely it is that the unit is franchised. And their model specifically designed to fr explain franchises can't explain that. In fact, they, they've, in their model, they find that uh, the franchised McDonald's outlets are near headquarters instead of thousands of miles away, which is what we see in reality. But when you think about it, Franchise contracts are absolutely no different from every other incentive contract. Fran franchises are used when uh, when face-to-face -face monitoring is not possible, when when the local outlet is near headquarters. Face-to-face uh, -face monitoring is possible, so that's it's owned by the outlet, owned by McDonald's. But as you go further away, more and more franchising is used because that, these are high powered incentives because very little is known about the manager's action. So you have to provide much stronger incentive just as you do with startups and in, in IPOs. So the distant fast food outlets are deficient in face-to-face -face monitoring, thus require high powered franchise incentives. So my model explains as a limiting case, the standard uh, agency model. It explains franchise contracts. It explains all kinds of contracts because the intuition is correct. When you've got good information, good quality signal, uh, that's great because it means you don't have to put much weight on it. You can put a very low weight on a powerful signal and get very high performance at low cost. Whereas Armstrong and Terrell, for example, um, find the opposite. So this is this is what Holmstrom and Terrell do. Um, they they uh, use they find a, a new variable B, which is a, a transform of of A. In fact B is equal to alpha times information. So it doesn't make any sense to have as your main variable something that contains information. And what they find is that uh, this is what they get. So that as you increase the level of information, B falls. Sorry, B, this is in the denominator. So B actually goes up. Not surprising, it goes up because it's a it's a product of alpha and and mu. So uh, Holmstrom and Terrell, which is cited by thousands of people, uh, and ten thousand by Holmstrom, 
uh, as using the wrong variable. Instead of using their original variable, they use a transform variable which moves in the opposite direction to their original variable. But if you solve out for the original variable, this is what they did. But notice that they've got a minus one here instead of the plus one. So that, that means that A gets very big, it gets greater than one, so the company gives away more than 100% um, to the manager and eventually it becomes negative because this term will become, become negative. Uh, so their mathematics is completely back to front. Why, why, how did that happen? Well, because they wanted to get rid of this one, uh, this uh, one minus alpha term, which is a free float by using a, a very peculiar transform. And in doing that, they, they committed many mathematical errors. That's why mathematically their, their conclusions are 100% uh, incorrect. So, um, given that, yeah, so I guess we, no. So what, what, what do I show then? That internal monitoring difficulties due to the absence of form, informed traders leads to higher powered incentives. We've seen this in the case of uh, franchisees. McDonald's used to keep 25% of its outlets under its own management, 75% outside, but the 25% the under its own management all, all very closely linked to headquarters located in the headquarters city. And uh, it was the more distant ones which are most likely to be uh, franchised. And that's exactly the same as what we see in stocks that uh, small, high, illiquid, very hard to, to manage stocks where we know nothing about the principle, nothing about the manager's actions uh, require very high incentives. So we typically see founders owning uh, a very sizable share of the company. The founder and the CEO has to be highly incentivized. But as the company becomes very large, that every doubling of firm size leads to a halving of that pay performance sensitivity and uh, the management improves. So. I explained the evolution of the modern corporation due to informed traders. Stock market liquidity promotes informed traders and the effectiveness of managerial incentives. It induces a lower stock price weight and a higher relative accounting non-price weight if both are used. Uh, explains the halving of the number of listed US companies since 1996. Uh, due to a regulatory induced rise in the implicit cost of being listed. So uh, this literature on the disappearance of, of com listed companies, especially in the United States, it, it focuses um, on, on explaining that it's only the, the, the very largest companies in the size distribution which are listed. Mum and dad stocks, mum and dad companies, medium sized companies, 95% uh, uh, of these smaller companies are not listed. Uh, if you take this, the largest companies in any, in any industry, you'll find with 10,000 or more employees that mostly they, these will be listed. And these large companies are the only ones that can survive uh, these implicit listing costs because of Regulators have focused on so-called improving the boards of listed companies, imposing all sorts of requirements which shareholders would not normally choose. And uh, that's disadvantaged listed companies relative to private equity. So private equity is growing many, many times faster than public equity. $3.6 trillion has been taken out of public equity in recent years. There's disinvestment in public uh, equity. and uh, So um, that's the, so what, what I'm suggesting then is this very simple model, a limiting case of the standard agency model, but it explains many, many things that were previously inexplicable, explains um, how company um, liquidity explains incentive contracts, 
that large companies with liquid companies with a lot more informed trading have huge advantages, which is why they're able to survive when smaller companies cannot, explains uh, franchise contracts. In fact, I believe it explains all kinds of agency contracts in a very simple, intuitive uh, manner. So I thank you very much for um, listening. And I'm looking forward to some very tough questions. Thank you, Peter. Um, this is now time for question. Uh, We've got two questions from Crystal Karuna. Uh, the first one, I guess, more like a comment. So the first one is Holmstrom Milk Rum 1991 and the multitasking agency research in the covering provides robust evidence for the role of earnings in contract. So earning and stock-based incentive are needed to motivate short and long-term managerial actions. So I think this is related to um, the part of the presentation when you discuss about the roles of accounting and you should not rewarded uh, managers with negative accounting performance. Yes, which uh, some of the major papers in accounting conclude that managers should be awarded with uh, negative weights for accounting performance. But that, that is a problem with, with the, um, the models that they're using. They, they can't be a viable solution. And we'll ne never see that in reality. And uh, as I said, Kor Gwai uh, uh, and others have indicated that uh, in practice, um, incentive weights are all price-based or 1,200% more than all the, all the feasible non-priced weights you could use, including accounting weights. So their evidence is pretty hard to refute that uh, uh, stock price incentives in listed companies are, are very important. Sure. Uh, and the second question also from Crystal is how you, how your insight difference from Pendergrass 2002, sorry for my pronunciation, will argue that for a positive relation between risk and incentive and the author criticized the standard agency models. Yes. Uh, it's true that my, my paper explains all the empirical findings, which I agree with in, in Prendergast's paper, but Prendergast's paper it has to be written off. It's not an agency paper at all because uh, in his world, um, the, the, the agent is risk neutral. So there's no need for an agency relationship. The agent can simply buy, buy the, the firm and have perfect uh, first best incentives. If he, if he, uh, so his, his paper violates the whole literature on incentives because it focuses on, uh, on the case where the agent and the principal are both risk neutral. And in which case we know, or you know the contract is first best. So there is no agency issue there. Uh, and so unfortunately, um, that, as I said, uh, my paper explains all his empirical findings, but rejects his model because his model says nothing about agency issues because there are no each agency issues based on his assumptions. He's not really an agency theorist at all, unfortunately. Sure. So we still have time for, for the questions. So you can open the floor to the panelists if you want to ask any questions. Uh, Terry, Chandra, Bala, Sagarika. Okay, so let me ask you a question, Peter. So uh, what is your views about regulations from um, encouraging, um, let's say, microstructure changes uh, with the view that encouraging liquidities and potentially uh, inducing change in a listing costs or encourage firms to be listed, for example. So what I have in mind is like the, the recent US TICSI pilot uh, programs and all of these related others, microstructure changes. So how would they fit into your models and what's your view about those change? Uh, well, I have a number of papers on those, exactly on those topics, both on the, uh, on the tick pilot uh, and uh, indirectly on the failed um, access fee pilot, which fortunately never got, got off the ground. Um, so, 
we look at uh, access fees and show that make or take of fee arrangements actually uh, um, not only improve liquidity, but actually subsidize um, price discovery. So they make the market a lot more efficient. And um, moreover, uh, if, if a, um, an exchange sets up a make or take arrangement where it subsidizes um, limit orders or, or make orders, it will simultaneously set up the opposite. It'll set up uh, uh, an exchange which subsidizes uh, take fees and, and taxes limit orders or taxes um, make orders. Is it's oh, because a tra the market is interested in, in the overall efficiency of the market and having both kinds of uh, of types with um, both maker taker and inverted markets improves efficiency, improves the consumer surplus earned by by uh, participants. And by the way, uh, we prove that all of those theory papers published in, in the Journal of Finance and Review of Financial Studies and elsewhere claiming that uh, these um, access fees wash out are, are false. And uh, then they claim, well, insert claim that, that the minimum tick actually uh, makes make or take a fees viable. That's not, what, that's not correct either. It has the opposite effect. So the, the error in all of these papers is pretty obvious when you think about it because there is, they're assuming that you can have a high price in the make or take a market for, for, for say IBM and a, a low price in the inverted uh, market because one is subsidized and the other is taxed. But they're not allowing arbitrage. When arbitrage takes place between the make or take and inverted markets, equates the price. So the, the same stock, uh, is priced at the same level in all markets. So 300 different variants on the maker taker fee arrangement. So the price is the same across all 300 variants, which means that their, their theorems about uh, washing out of, of the access fees fails. So we show that, that uh, maker take of fee arrangements are actually very beneficial. And uh, this is confirmed by the NASDAQ uh, fee experiment, which uh, my co-author participated in. And uh, what that showed was when you convert a, a group of uh, stocks with subsidized maker take arrangements, remove the subsidy, uh, then everything goes to hell. Volume falls, information falls, uh, the market becomes very ineffective and of course they lose market share because they no longer ha have the they're no longer priced at the best bid and ask yeah so that, but the it's the regulators are the ones um, really doing the, the damage to listed companies by requiring a majority of professional part-time directors who are they called independent, but they're not independent because they're really dependent on the, on the CEO and management. So they can't, they can't really question management. It makes a very weak corporate governance, which is why we see this massive uh, deterioration in, in the listed sector and the, the disappearance of majority of small uh, listed companies and even small IPOs can no longer get off the ground uh, because they're disadvantaged by bad boards uh, and private equity doesn't have the same problem because they're not yet regulated. Sure. I think we run out of time. So I would last, like to ask you if you have any final concluding remarks before I give it back to Bala. Well, I'd like to thank Bala and the committee for inviting me to give this talk and for, for the very generous uh, Lifetime Achievement uh, Award. Uh, 
and uh, it's really great too to see this cooperation taking place between so many different uh, universities. Universities are going to be very cash strapped for some time to come, so we must look for more innovative ways of meeting and, and expanding our knowledge base. Bella as at the forefront of doing this. Yeah, thank you, Peter. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so um, over to you, Bella. Uh, thank you, Peter, for uh, presenting your key, presenting the keynote for, uh, to, to us, particularly. Um, so we were we were actually celebrating your achievement uh, in the at the conference, but I didn't know that you have published all top five economist journal uh, before you even get your PhD. Well, I had two, 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 two in uh, JPE and uh, QJE, Econometrica, uh, Bell Journal, um, and and so on and we are struggling so forth. Get, uh, we are struggling to get a paper published, even an A study. <laughs> so, it's um, I I was must must admit that I was. Uh, surprised by this response but it just shows you that that with very simple theory and uh, you can really make a difference and uh, these this group of papers have now got thousands of citations and uh, they're still being cited today uh, 50 years on yeah I think the, the, the financial market and corporate governance is, you know, uh, is lucky to have you as our keynote speaker. Uh, that's the important thing, you know. Um, we are very fortunate hmm, to have you here, right? And uh, uh, celebrate uh, your achievement. Uh, and I hope that, you know, you keep, keep going and keep going and uh, possibly in 10 years time, hmm, so when we when we were organizing the I mean nine years time when we organizing the twentieth financial market corporate governance conference, we would love to invite you again. <laughs> well, that's going to be very generous of you. It'll probably what? take me another ten years to get this paper published because uh, <laughs> Ben is a lovely guy and he's got thousands of friends and uh, it's just inexplicable to me as to uh, I mean he. He admits that his findings are wrong, but he doesn't like the idea that he made mathematical errors because he thinks of himself as being a very polished mathematical mathematician. Uh, but he's, he certainly uh, made a number of uh, errors there and, and convincing top journals to, uh, to, to, to accept this is, is a pretty tough road. So you will be a role model for many of us. Hmm? <laughs> well, I hope to continue. To achieve, <laughs> to reach at least 15% of you what you achieve, you know. We don't need to achieve 25%. But you have achieved 15% or 20%, you know, in our lifetime we achieve. Uh, yes, thanks well, again, Peter. Well, I've got one a PhD student presenting in, in your session tomorrow for the PhD forum and he, he's an excellent scholar. and. Uh, Number other very productive um, PhD graduates and students. So hopefully they're going to continue their good work. Sure, sure. So okay. Okay, sure. Thanks, Peter. And I leave it to the panel because you know you can spend a couple of minutes uh, with uh, Peter uh, talking. Then we will. I think the more we can close it at uh, four seven four eight.